ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the Chicago Healthcare Tableau User Group. Um, we've got a, some great presentations today about data governance with some uh, great presenters, Timothy Arnold from Advocate Aurora Health and Brandy Beals, a Tableau ambassador. Um, I'm Kelly Sims of the um, Chicago Healthcare Tug Leadership Group. I am an analyst who works at the Lake County Health Department. I've been using Tableau for about four years now. Um, and that's all I'll say about me. I'll hand it off to the rest of the leadership group to um, introduce themselves. Imran? Hello. Uh, hello, Imran here. I'm a senior data warehouse analyst at Rush University Medical Center. And, uh, yeah, welcome all. Heather, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. It's Heather Clapp Nelson from Advocate Aurora Health. Uh, we are so glad that you guys are all here. Today's all about data governance, and I am really proud to have Tim Arnold join us uh, and anxious to see this presentation. Um, I have been an advocate for 17 years, and I'm a manager over uh, some BI responsibilities and reporting in a variety of systems, but Tableau is kind of at the heart of what I love. So uh, I do enjoy these sessions and working with each of you uh, at whatever stage of your Tableau journey you're on. Chandani? Hello, all. I am Chandani. I uh, am a senior healthcare data analyst at um, Illinois Health and Hospital Association. A lot of uh, people might know a lot of the dashboards and data that you might uh, get from us or work with from us. So feel free to ask any questions also in the chat. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of work in Tableau as well, building a lot of dashboards and um, providing some insights and answering questions. So. Let me know if you have any questions. Great, so we'll get started, jump right on in into our first uh, presentation and how to get started with data governance with Timothy Arnold. Um, and the presentation will be a broad overview. So it'll give us a little bit of everything. And Timothy, I'll let you introduce yourself and take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, I'm Tim Arnold. I'm the VP of Data Assets at Advocate Aurora Health. I've been in healthcare uh, about 20 years now, mostly mostly focused on um, healthcare operations, operations improvement, healthcare administration, uh, that sort of thing. The past five or six years, it's been a little more heavy on the data and technology side. Um, and my current role at Advocate Aurora is focused on helping the organize help helping the organization maximize the value that we can get from our data assets, hence the title. So I've got a presentation. Let me, uh, yeah, Kelly, I'm gonna grab the, the screen share here. So bear with me. Uh, it's a couple of clicks, uh, not that, but wait for it. All right. So I trust my uh, co-hosts will make sure that if I'm doing anything wrong technically, um, that uh, they'll they'll let me know if you're not seeing my screen. Additionally, I'm working with one monitor today. Um, I know, shame on me uh, for even attempting to do so, but that means I don't, uh, I can't really see the chat or if people raise uh, hands or that sort of thing. Given the size of this group, I would absolutely encourage you um, and invite you to ask any questions, stop me at any point in this presentation. Um, I'm more than happy to unpack this. Uh, so let me jump right in. If you're not familiar with Advocate Aurora, uh, this slide is a touch outdated, but um, uh, this bit over here, the, the footprint um, is still representative of uh, where Advocate Aurora uh, cares for patients. So, you know, we're we're centered in uh, Northeast Illinois and Eastern Wisconsin. Um, I think uh, since this is a little bit dated, we're a little bit bigger. I think we have closer to 75,000 team members now, 14 billion in, in revenue, um, but we're the largest um, healthcare system in the region. Uh, and if you watch the news or paying close attention to Advocate Aurora Health, um, we uh, are angling to, to join forces with Atrium Health 
um, out of the Southeast, which would effectively double the size of the organization um, from where it is today. So uh, this, this slide, even though it's outdated, will very likely be even more outdated uh, a few months from now. So let me jump right into to data governance as a definition. Um, if, you know, I would expect that this group would at least have heard uh, this term. It gets used a lot. It gets used very liberally. Uh, and in many cases, it's, it's used properly because data governance can mean lots of different things to many different people, and, and they're all correct. Um, I'm borrowing this definition uh, from the book I referenced at the bottom, a book by Robert Siner, uh, non-invasive data governance, which um, I would highly recommend uh, it, for anybody who's interested in the topic. It is uh, an easy to read kind of how to um, set up a, a data governance program, the, the facets of it. Uh, so this is his definition that data governance is the formal execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data and data related assets. Um, that feels a little bit heavy handed, especially for a book that's entitled Non-Invasive Data Governance. So he he supplies a secondary uh, definition, which um, I, I find to be a bit more useful uh, in mixed company, which is uh, formalizing behavior around the definition, production and usage of data to manage risk and improve quality and usability of selected data. Uh, and the the underlining and the, the highlights, that's mine. I like this framework for understanding data environments in general, definition, production, and usage. If you're talking about data, the activities associated with data typically fall into any one of those three categories. Um, definition is going to be, uh, you know, exactly what you think it is: defining terms, um, maintaining those definitions, ensuring that people understand them, uh, helping data comport to certain standards. Production is just the manner in which the data gets generated. Um, so anytime somebody's inputting any some uh, you know anything or uh, creating additional artifacts related to data, that's going to be the production piece. Uh, and then usage is the the output. So when we think about Tableau or reporting in general, um, typically we talk about using the data that has been defined and produced. Um, we're now using it. We're creating secondary data off of you know primary sources or or. Uh, you know, upstream sources of data uh, to create new additional uh, data. So in the context of creating a report, um, you, you're probably doing all three of these things in terms of defining, producing, and using data, um, just depending on your frame of reference. Uh, the other thing I like about it is this notion that data governance is about managing risk and improving quality and usability of selected data. So uh, I'm going to talk more about um, the, the journey that Advocate Aurora is on, and admittedly, we're in the very early stages, so I'm not an expert on data governance. Um, I think our experiences may be useful uh, for others who, who might be thinking about engaging in this journey. Also, my presentation is going to be at a very high level. I do get a little bit into the weeds at the end, but it's mostly at a high level, um, which I'm hoping for a data-interested uh, audience, as I'm sure this is, um, it should should be broadly uh, interesting at minimum if it's not you know directly applicable to your day-to-day -day responsibilities. But these contexts of managing risk and improving quality and usability, I think, are important. From a reporting standpoint, um, I think that falls more in the space of improving quality and usability. Um, but I'm sure in your own data environments and worlds, uh, the concept of managing risk has come up uh, more than a few times. Uh, so anyway, this definition, I think, is a useful reference point uh, for data govern governance in general. And if you don't know anything else about data governance, um, just keep this definition in mind because, it, as I say, it's been a very useful framework as we've engaged in our journey and helped to uh, help other people in the organization understand what we're talking about when we say data governance. Uh, all right. So given those definitions on the prior page, uh, are you doing data governance today? Absolutely, you are. Uh, these are some examples that I'm taking from Advocate Aurora, but for anybody in the healthcare space, you may very well be doing things similar uh, to this, uh, you know, annual compliance and HIPAA training, certain data-related policies, data kept in secure environments. You know, by that, I mean anything that requires a login. Um, certainly, anybody who has an EHR um, there are systems in place uh, to monitor usage and to flag inappropriate usage. There are records, records retention practices, uh, and, and it goes on and on. All of these 
um, are forms of data governance, whether people are calling it that or not, whether you have a data governance committee or a formal data governance infrastructure, data governance is already happening in your environment. Um, and you'll notice with some of these, they're oriented, the examples I provide here are oriented a little bit more towards the managing risk uh, or minimizing risk component of it, uh, but something like operational definitions for KPI reporting uh, would fall into this other bucket of improving the quality and usability of data. Uh, so besides the fact that we're doing data governance today, we've also been doing data governance for a long, long time. Again, um, this type of image is becoming increasingly antiquated. And maybe if you're of a certain age, you won't know exactly what I'm showing here. But um, for those of us who remember life before the EHR, um, anytime you were receiving healthcare anywhere, uh, you would see this. These are medical records, non-electric medical records, the good old fashioned hard copy version of those. Um, and it was a significant undertaking for you know, even a small doctor's office, never mind a very large academic medical center, um, to keep tabs and manage all of these medical records. And they, they took up enormous amounts of uh, space. Um, and uh, the, the way in which these were managed um, in, in terms of what data made it into the physical chart, um, how that information was organized, where it got stored when a patient wasn't actively being cared for or somebody wasn't actively using the chart, um, and how long this, these um, records were retained, so on and so forth. All of that could be considered data governance. And I know, I think data governance has been getting a lot more attention in this age of electronic data where, you know, virtually all the data we're talking about is electronic, uh, but the concepts of data governance certainly predate electronic data. Um, and the, the good old fashioned paper chart uh, is a good example of data governance uh, in action. Here are some general principles uh, associated with data governance. Um, again, I said it's very broadly defined or it can be very broadly defined and that's appropriate. So these principles of accountability, transparency, so on and so forth listed here on the left, those are all fair game in the space of data governance. Um, the reason I circled these three in particular, transparency, integrity, availability, is for anybody involved in report writing, report generation, report usage, is probably gonna be a little more interested in these three in particular. Um, you know, availability, working backwards, availability of the data, um, any sorts of reports that you're creating or that sort of thing, uh, how are you getting them out? Uh, to whom are you making these available? How easily accessible are they? Um, do there need to be, does there need to be security around that so that not anybody or everybody can access them? So that's a consideration. Um, integrity, that could mean a variety of things. Um, I'm gonna narrowly define it around uh, kind of the, the consistency of your data. In, integrity of data uh, could be just how faithfully is the data flowing through its processes to end up on a report. Um, it could also have to do with how that data is defined. Uh, and then transparency, um, how visible uh, are data practices? Um, so with regards to a report, how easy is it for people to see whether that report's being used and by whom and that sort of thing? These are all principles of data governance. Um, and these three in particular, I think, of note to this group, even if you're not spending your day focused on uh, compliance, for instance, or retention and disposition. Uh, all right, so I, I mentioned that we are early in this journey at Advocate Aurora. Uh, and, and I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here because um, I, I said we've been doing data governance forever. Uh, however, it was only at the start of 2022 that we uh, formally stood up uh, an enterprise-wide um, data governance committee. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about the interplay between you know, prior practices and, and what we're doing today. But anyway, we started um, the, the data governance committee uh, at the start of this year. Um, that was the first time we met. It includes representation um, from some of the places that you would assume, like BI and analytics, uh, health informatics, um, but we've got a pretty broad umbrella, including other um, uh, interested parties in terms of data governance. So legal, ethic, ethics, compliance, privacy, so on and so forth. Um, all of these uh, stakeholders have um, important opinions and perspectives with regards to data governance, uh, and we're thrilled they're at the, at the table for us. Um, we have been focused this year on minimizing data-related risk. In fact, 
the reason why we stood up this committee was because there were a number of things happening, a, a number of data related things happening across the organization where it was unclear who could figure, you know, who could solve this problem. Um, a bit of a hot potato or questions of authority or even questions of expertise around how to navigate those things. So we're starting on data related risk. That's been our focus for the first three quarters. Um, we are now starting to get towards what I would consider, we're, we're moving towards um, a higher level of maturity in terms of our data governance uh, uh, journey. So we're focusing on a data inventory. I'm not gonna get too much into the details there, um, but we're keeping that very high level right now. Um, our plan into 2023 and beyond is that we're unifying uh, data governance practices across the enterprise. So where things are already in place, we're not looking to uh, tell people how to do it. Uh, we just want to make sure that there's a level of consistency uh, across our data governance operations across the organization. Uh, and I touched a little bit upon this. You know, if if we're already doing data governance, why would we stand up this uh, this committee? Everything's becoming more complicated. The organization itself is increasing in complexity. The data environment is increasing in complexity. We know that there are things that we can do better than what we're doing today. And probably these four bullets could apply to just about any organization. So I don't think we're unique in this regard. Um, and I think the need for improved data governance exists uh, probably everywhere. Um, this gets a little bit at our philosophy in terms of how we are approaching uh, data governance internally. Um, and this is also consistent with kind of the philosophy expressed in that non-invasive data governance book I referenced earlier. Um, so we are not looking um, as a committee, as a force, we are not looking to come in and tear down existing data governance structures. Um, in fact, Areas where it's already happening, where things are well-defined, where some data governance best practices are in play, again, whether people are calling it that or not, we're not looking to, to upset the apple cart. So it's not a new sheriff in town approach. And I think this is useful too, if you think about employing data governance um, or data governance principles uh, in your neck of the woods. Um, I would highly recommend looking to see where it's already happening. Don't assume that it's not happening, even if there's no data governance committee, if people aren't calling that, uh, calling it that per se. Um, try to look for people, because I'm sure there are people in your organization who take seriously the principles of data governance, whether, again, whether or not they're referring it to it as such. Um, and you don't want to tear those down or indicate that, hey, um, you know, we're here to fix a problem. Uh, you you really actually want to harness the the power of those existing structures. So this gets at the approach the approach that we've been taking, and one that I would recommend is you know how can we help? So and especially for the people who are already vested in data governance principles, they'll be the first ones who can tell you where there are holes in the practice, and they might say I don't know who to you know who to help with this or or how to navigate that. Um, and and there are always roles that e even an individual, uh, well-intentioned individual contributor um, who's working in their domain, there are always things that you can do to help improve um, data governance. Uh, so this philosophy that we've been employing with our system level data governance committee, I think is something um, that could be broadly applicable to, to you know, anybody who's looking to improve data governance at their organization. Um, Again, keeping this at a very high level, I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of the first things that our data governance committee did, uh, and then I'll share an example that gets into the weeds um, and then uh, wrap up my presentation for, for any questions. Um, so one of the first things that we did as a committee was to align on you know, what's our data purpose. Um, and maybe this sounds high-minded or unnecessary, um, but we were finding some complicated conversations around data were occurring or were trying to happen across the organization. Things around data monetization, around vendors uh, using Advocate Aurora data, um, around third party data that we received from other entities where there were contractual or legal um, uh, restrictions on how the data could be used. and all sorts of creative ideas that people had around how we could use that internally and whether or not that's okay. Um, all of these things were, were kind of pointing to the fact that we would do well to have a very clear 
system level point of view on using our data. Um, and, and fortunately for us, Advocate Aurora has a very clear purpose. Um, uh, you know, you might also call it a mission. You hear organizations talking about mission, vision, values. Advocate Aurora refers to it as a purpose, uh, which is that we help people live well. Um, what I like about this is for anybody in healthcare, you probably have the same purpose, wh whether or not you're calling it this uh, or, or, or not. Um, so helping people live well is at the core of what we do. Uh, and so we didn't get overly created when we uh, reflected on what should our data purpose be. Our data should be used to help people live well. Um, again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, so we, we weren't going overboard and trying to wordsmith something um, extra special. And indeed, when you're thinking about this, I often feel that simpler is better. Um, it's a whole lot easier to, to remember we help people live well. And then correspondingly, our data should be used to help people live well, rather than some mouthful of jargony words uh, describing organizational mission or data mission. And, and we could make it complicated. In fact, a lot of the personalities involved in this process are specialists in adding words and making things complicated. So I was very proud of us uh, for keeping this simple. However, it does beg just a little more explanation. So after the purpose of, you know, our data should be used to help people live well, we did define a little bit more. We call these our data use principles. Um, you know, how should the data be used and how shouldn't it be used? So here we're saying that our data should be used to improve the health and well-being of our patients. That's obviously at the core of what we do and, and at the core of what I'm sure many of your organizations do. Um, improve the health and well-being of our communities. Uh, these first two bullets aren't mutually exclusive per se, but with communities, we're looking to, to think broader than just the patients who are seeking care in our four walls. Um, the third is to improve the organization's ability to provide better care. So still the focus on care, but if you think about what you could put into this particular bullet, improve the organization's ability to provide better care, that runs the gamut. Um, and for, for people who would be concerned about the finances or the financial health of an organization, and certainly right now it's a tough time uh, for, for healthcare organizations across the country, um, that's where something like this uh, would fall into play. So improve the organization's ability to provide better care. Obviously, we have an interest in financial stewardship because that's key to remaining solvent and in investing in ways to better care for our patients and make sure uh, we're paying our staff competitive wages, yada, yada, yada. So that would fall into this third bucket of improving the organization's ability to provide better care and thinking about how we use our data to support that. And then finally, advancing healthcare in ways that can benefit all people. Um, and for any sort of organization that has a research function or who's committed to research, that would really fall into this bucket. So there are some things, and indeed the, you know, the purpose of research is to create generalizable knowledge that could benefit uh, humankind. Uh, and so it may not necessarily, there might be some research we're doing or research we're participating in that doesn't necessarily satisfy um, any one of these top three bullets, um, but would advance healthcare in ways that can benefit all people. Uh, so anyway, these not too wild and crazy. I like them in their simplicity. I also think they're quite comprehensive when we think about how we should be using our data um, and the ways that we're already using our today data today. Um, and then also some guardrails. Um, so when we're talking about data use, what if the first if the first slide is what are the do's of of um, data use, then our second slide is is what are the don'ts. Um, and so these are the the guardrails that we uh, are putting on our data use. So a uh, we're saying that organizational data use should not compromise patient privacy. Um, indeed, with HIPAA and other uh, laws on the books, um, there are plenty of activities that are illegal. Um, but at our core, this is something that we don't want to compromise. So we want to make sure that our data use practices are not compromising patient privacy. Um, we don't want to erode the trust of our patients, communities, team members, and partners. This is one, especially on some of the, the more cutting edge things that are happening in the space, especially around data monetization, um, use of third-party data. Um, this is where that comes into play, is what sort of activities might be well-intentioned by the, the users, um, but could run this risk of eroding trust that exists. And certainly healthcare data in particular 
enjoys a special space as it should uh, when people think about uh, data and data use. Uh, and <clears throat> this day and age where people, most people or a lot of informed people just assume that when you're interacting with some sort of technology platform or with one of the major tech companies, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, there's an assumption that your data is being used. Uh, and oftentimes you might start seeing an ad on your streaming service that was for something that you Googled not that long ago, 12 or 24 hours ago, if that, um, which can feel big brothery and, and creepy. Um, healthcare data, when, when you think about how this data gets captured in very intimate settings, and, and I'm talking about clinical data that gets captured by clinicians in doctor's offices, in hospitals, um, patients are in a very vulnerable space in that. There's a very intimate environment when that's be, being collected, but we've all, anybody who's received healthcare in the last 10 years is getting used to the fact that the person who is caring for them might simultaneously be typing into a keyboard as they're trying to, to talk and, and listen um, uh, to the patient. Um, so that data is being captured real time, um, but we don't think that that data that's being captured real time is being used in the same way that you know data that we're uh, you know, providing free of charge to these tech companies, um, and it's not. So we take very seriously any sort of uh, use of our data that could uh, potentially erode the trust um, of all the people we're interacting with. Uh, we take that very seriously. So th this one is, um, uh, is extremely important when we think about data use, and I think is one that others could keep in mind anytime um, you're generating data or talking about how data should or should not be used. Um, we certainly don't want to use data to perpetuate or exacerbate any inequities. Um, this health equity is a big focus at Advocate Aurora, as it is at a lot of healthcare organizations. Um, it's been getting a whole lot more attention since uh, the pandemic. Um, although in the lead up to the pandemic, it was, you know, it was getting more and more attention. The pandemic just kind of pushed it over the edge, as it's it's pushed a lot of things over the edge. Uh, so this is something we want to be mindful of. And then the last two should go without saying, but it's always good to, to say them rather than leave them unsaid, which is we don't want our data used to violate contractual obligations uh, or break the law. So all of this was fairly high level. I'm going to, uh, I got one more high level slide and I'm, I'm taking a look at time check. Maybe I'll uh, talk a little bit faster and, and move through this uh, quicker than I have been. Um, so as you think about a data governance uh, structure, this pyramid is a use, useful way to think about data governance at uh, at multiple levels. Uh, so at the high level, um, at the enterprise level, uh, it serves a strategic function. That's about de determining the vision, structure, organizational priorities as it pertains to data use. Um, and that's going to be something like the enterprise level data governance committee um, that I talked about before. Um, but I acknowledge that we were doing data governance before this committee existed. Um, and your organization, whether it, it has something, it has a formal program or not, is doing data governance. Um, and if anything, uh, if it doesn't have a formal program, it might be missing this top tier uh, to the, the pyramid, uh, but I can assure you that things are certainly happening in the lower tiers. Um, so the tactical, uh, the tactical layer pertains to data that cuts across the organization. And here you might have people that, um, that at least in the non-invasive data governance uh, book, um, the, the author refers to as data domain stewards. Um, and uh, in the healthcare space, one data term that I like to focus on at the tactical tier is something like a hospital bed. Um, so a hospital bed, in theory, that's that should be easy to define. It's pretty straightforward. Um, for anybody who's lived this reality, you know that it is not simple. There are a million different ways, maybe not a million, but <laughs> enough to make your life difficult. Um, a number of different ways to define a hospital bed, whether you're talking about a licensed bed, a physical bed, a room that can accommodate a bed, um, a stretcher in an ER, uh, a staffed bed versus an unstaffed bed, um, beds that are under construction, yada, yada, yada. Uh, we found at the start of the pandemic when uh, our leaders were saying, what proportion of our hospital beds are filled with uh, COVID patients? Um, never mind the fact that there wasn't there weren't, there weren't existing uh, data standards for COVID at the start of the pandemic, um, we realized that there weren't 
uh, useful standards pertaining to beds uh, so that we couldn't even provide a denominator for that. So that's where a data domain steward uh, becomes useful. And, and sometimes you're seeing this across organizations where people get together and align on um, you know, definitions uh, for terms that get used um, across different areas. Also, it can be where something like a bed gets defined in multiple different ways and the context um, can drive which definition you're using. Um, the operational tier is the space where uh, data governance is typically happening de facto, um, just because it has to. So this pertains to managing data at the business unit level. Um, and here you'll find what we call data stewards, um, individuals who, uh, and you probably have them in your organization. In fact, you might be a data steward uh, for a particular function or a particular set of data. These are the experts who understand the data in and out, um, who manage it. Um, I will point out that we're using the term stewards and not owners. Um, that semantic uh, distinction is important. Um, and this wasn't my idea. Again, this is in the book and you're seeing this across the industry when people talk about data governance. Um, the notion of a steward is somebody who cares for the data, who manages the data. Um, but the reason we're not calling them owners in this context is the data um, in most uh, situations uh, belongs to the organization or belongs to uh, you know, some other entity, some higher level entity. Um, you don't want people getting in the habit of protecting the data because it's theirs or not sharing it. Uh, you know, it's siloed. This happens at every organization. If it doesn't happen at yours, congratulations. I'm so glad to hear that you're living in a utopia. Um, but for the rest of us, you are going to find pockets where somebody's very protective of a certain application and the data that lives in that application, and they're very reluctant to share it because they're afraid of how people are going to use it or what people are going to learn when they see it. Um, so we really try to enforce this notion of data stewards. Like it's not your job to protect the data and keep others away from it. And maybe I'll be careful with the word protect um, uh, because protecting data is not bad per se, but the notion of a steward is hey, I'm here to, to help the organization get maximum value um, from this data. And I'm also here to ensure that we minimize any risk associated with the data. That would be the role of a steward, um, which I think is important. All right, so this has all been high level. Let me take it into the weeds a little bit. I know Brandy, who's uh, presenting after me, um, she's going to give uh, a little more tactical information. So if you found my presentation to be boring, not at all useful to you, don't despair. Please stay on the line because Brandy will be giving you more tactical Tableau related uh, tips and tricks uh, after this. Um, and if Brandy, if, if I misrepresented your, your presentation, I'm sure you'll, you'll set the audience straight when you come on. Um, so here's an example uh, related to hypertension. So high blood pressure, very common. Um, at our organization, I mentioned that we're interested in health equity and improving health equity. Uh, and so one of our areas of focus is to reduce disparities in the rate of uncontrolled hypertension. And so if you think back to the principles of data governance around improving the quality and usability of the data, there were a number of data governance related considerations having to do with how this data was defined um, that we had to, to, to navigate before we could um, help the organization reduce these disparities. So we had to define the population. Who are we talking about? Which patients are we talking about? Um, and there are a variety of different ways to define patient populations. For an organization like Advocate Aurora that practices in, um, you know, in some markets like Chicagoland and Milwaukee, where there are lots of other areas where people can receive care, um, then we had to figure out, okay, which patients have a relationship, so to speak, with Advocate Aurora. And in this case, we said anybody who's had an encounter of any type in each of the last two years. So defining that population, that was a process. Um, and I could spend a lot of time going into that, but I'm getting short of time, so I should spend less time on it. But feel free to, to ask me offline if you have questions related to that. Um, which groups are we interested in? Um, you know, we talk about uh, Black, White, Hispanic. In the, the media, you'll hear people refer to Black and Brown populations. Um, the census has very... Uh, specific definitions around African American slash Black, Caucasian slash White, uh, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, um, Asian, you know, th th there are these uh, conventions that the U.S. Census use, uses, and then we need to consider how are we collecting that? What do we do when patients mark multiple uh, categories? What 
you know, for the purposes of identifying disparities, we, we need to put patients into buckets, even though a patient might not fit cleanly into a bucket. Um, so how are we navigating that? That was a conversation. Even something like uncontrolled hypertension, um, we can lean on standards that exist like HEDIS to, to help us define that. Um, but still, we had to make some adjustments internally. Uh, and then the goal, how, you know, how do we define, once we've defined all of this, what are the gaps? How do we close them? What does that look like? All of those would be considered forms of data governance. These are probably things that you do on a daily basis. So whether you're calling it data governance or not, um, it's happening and you're doing it. Um, and then in terms of the, the process, and, and here you probably know all of this, um, and this has more to do with operationalizing what we did from those conversations. So the, the data model had to be built out based on all those, all those definitions that I was talking about on the prior slide. Um, but then when we think about the usability of the data, um, you know, here we're just trying to say what's the goal, who's in, who's out. But for the people who are trying to impact uh, this and improve um, hypertension, there were additional data elements they needed. Um, so things like zip codes, physicians, practices, those type of data elements that don't necessarily impact the goal or the way we've defined it, but that are critical uh, to the usability of this uh, of the the dashboard that ultimately uh, we created. Um, and that dashboard was focused on you know both showing people how we're doing for this particular uh, goal. Um, and we wanted to build in some flexibility to help with the people who are actually um, uh, enabling this change. Uh, so just a couple quick screenshots, because um, this one was built specifically in Tableau, as you can see. Um, and uh, this, you know, this is kind of the, the front page of it that, that shows some basic demographics uh, around um, our population, uh, those who are uncontrolled, um, those who have controlled hypertension, and then some uh, data around how we're progressing. I'm very pleased to, to show you that we are improving um, across our two target areas, which are, are the Black and Hispanic populations. Um, if we weren't doing as well, I probably wouldn't have shared these, these screenshots just to, to, be, to be forthright. Um, and then here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm masking this data here to protect the innocent. Um, these are some uh, drill downs that can show where are these patients located. Um, the coloring, uh, I think in this context, has to do with rates of uncontrolled for our target population. Um, these show us physicians and their corresponding rates, you know, which physicians have the most number of patients, um, which clinics have the most number of patients. And you can see uh, right here at the top, if you're paying close attention, um, a large proportion are unaffiliated with a clinic. This is part of the challenge of health equity is that we know that patients um, might not be receiving the care uh, that they should be, uh, or that could improve their their health and well-being, um, but they don't necessarily have a relationship with a healthcare provider. So that's what you see here. So I know I'm pushing right at time. I haven't left a lot of time for questions, but um, if you're tired of hearing me talk, uh, congratulations, I'm done. Um, are there any questions uh, that I can answer for folks uh, involving any of the content I've covered? Feel Hello? free to, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Tim, this is Dan Ryan uh, from down at Riverside in Kankakee. Uh, I, I had a question for you about um, governed versus ungoverned data and uh, what, if any, strategy you have to, to distinguish between the two. I mean, we, we have so much stuff out there and data can be anything from, you know, fields, within the Clarity database or within the EMR versus uh, CSVs and spreadsheets and all, all of this kind of, you know, loose content that can be out there and, and it's maintained by individual users. Have you guys come up with a strategy around that or are you, are you thinking about ways to direct people towards governed data? What has been your approach and discussion around that? Yeah, so great question. I would encourage you to to think about this across a few dimensions. One is that the notion of governed versus ungoverned data um, is probably more rightly thought about a spectrum um, of well-governed versus completely ungoverned data. Because you can always improve your governance of it, um, but for most of your data, there's probably at least some governance that's happening to it. So, so that's one distinction is to, to imagine the data you know, from this standpoint, governed versus ungoverned as being on a spectrum. The other thing to consider is around 
the value, the importance, or the risk associated with data. Um, so, uh, you know, when we talk about well-governed data versus ungoverned data, uh, there's some data that we really should have tight governance practices in place um, versus other data where that might not matter uh, so much. Um, so considering the importance of the data too when you're imagining this uh, framework. Uh, so we are just kind of getting into this space. We, we know just by virtue of the people who are on the committee and the relationships we have internally, uh, we know about pockets of the organization where data governance is happening um, quite well. Uh, and, you know, to give you one example, we have system level um, scorecards that, uh, you know, are, uh, are set annually. They're across a number of dimensions, uh, finance, safety, health outcomes, patient experience, consumer experience, um, diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, these are some major buckets. All of the measures that get defined on that annually, I would say, are very well governed. Um, and so this, for a, a system like ours that's very large, um, the way that we're enforcing tight governance on that is to centralize the reporting of those things um, and to, uh, to, to kind of make sure that people know this is a well-curated set of measures um, that are measured centrally and, and therefore they're consistent across the organization. So if we say, here's the readmission rate at one of our hospitals, nobody's saying, well, we measure it differently at a different hospital. Like that doesn't even come up because we're, we're doing those types of things centrally. Um, however, we do know that we have some opportunities to improve making clear to people what is well-managed or well-governed data versus other things that are not. And one of these areas that are weak for us, and I know, Dan, because you and I spoke uh, have spoken earlier, that at Riverside, you guys are doing some great stuff in this space to help differentiate between um, governed data or, or ungoverned data. But one area for us that is a weakness has to do with our epic reporting, especially things in Slicer or Dicer. There are just so many things out there um, for people that it can be difficult uh, to, to discern between, you know, what is well curated, well governed data versus those things that aren't. So again, the way that we're doing it internally, and this probably happens organically at your organizations, if you have centralized reporting, reports that everybody looks at, then good bet that those things are well governed, but that kind of happens, you know, by default, just because people are focused on it. There, there's, we definitely have more opportunity to help differentiate between that. So uh, we're, we're working on it. That was a long-winded response to, to your question. Dan, did you have any additional points on that or, or is that a good enough for now? I mean, thanks, I appreciate that. I, the only thing I would add is, uh, yeah, I, I think we do all right with technology, but it's, um, my goal is always around the culture. Like, how, how do I get the decision maker to be curious about the quality of the data that, you know, if whether it's budget or, or some other initiative, data is being brought to decision makers. How do I make sure that they're, they are literate and they understand data quality and they're asking the right, right questions to make sure that they're using high quality governed defined data? Yeah, that's anything. yeah, that's an even broader issue. I think the onus is on us as data junkies um, to help uh, the end users understand how this relates to their business objectives. Um, and if we as data junkies can't connect the dots, we can't tell them why this data is so critical to how they're running their operation, then maybe we're looking at the wrong data. Um, in many cases, though, we are looking at the right things, but we need to help them connect the dots to say, hey, here's why you should care about this. Here's how you should interpret this uh, because it's directly related to the business objectives that they have in their particular area. Any other questions from folks? I know I'm over time. Brandy, I'm sorry. Sorry about that in advance. Um, but are there any other questions from folks that I can answer while I'm here? It's okay that you're over time, Tim. We don't have a super strict schedule. I know we are um, a little late to start. So anyone, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or unmute yourself. Or you can hold on to them later too. And Save just them. Type them in the chat if you, yeah. Yeah, here's my email address. If you haven't screen grabbed this already, and I think we will be distributing the slides and or since this is recorded, it'll be posted. So feel free to reach out to me offline um, if you, you have additional questions. So with that, why don't I kick it over to Brandy? 
Sounds good. Thank you so much, Tim. That was a great overview of data governance. And we'll pass it off to Brandy. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Tim, for, I mean, just a wonderful presentation. Um, as you'll hear in a moment, I'm, I'm not in the healthcare space, but uh, instead I work in finance, which has its own set of like data governance and uh, date, you know, sensitive data um, components to it. So uh, a lot of those things still resonated um, even outside of the healthcare industry. Um, okay, I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. All right. And um, I'm just gonna bring up the chat real quick because um, like, like Timothy, I am a big fan of questions. So feel free to, um, to throw any questions you have for me in the chat. Um, and I will try my best to keep an eye on it and answer them as we go. Um, my presentation today is kind of about data governance best practices in the Tableau platform. And this is gonna take kind of two forms. One is within Tableau desktop, when you're building something, you know, when you're connecting to data or you're yeah, building calculated fields and things like that in Tableau desktop, what are some things that you can look out for? What are some features that you can leverage? Um, and, um, and then just more broadly, um, the second component is gonna focus a little bit more on Tableau server or Tableau cloud, which I think helps scale, scale up your data governance. Um, practice. So that's kind of what my, my goal of this discussion is today. Um, before we jump into that, uh, just a little bit about me. So I'm, I'm a data analytics manager, um, like I said, at a finance uh, firm, and I am in IT, and I'm the Tableau server administrator for my company. I help to run um, a center of practice. And um, I think it was Dan asked a question about, you know, like almost like data literacy for consumers of your data. And personally, I mean, I think all of these things, data literacy, data governance, data visualization, best practices, like all of these things are interconnected. And from my experience, I find that it's really important to like attack the problem from like multiple perspectives. So having data governance is amazing, right? Having data stewards is, I mean, you need data stewards to help answer questions about the data and make sure it's being used, you know, maybe appropriately or, um, you know, uh, like Tim mentioned, um, you know, like defining the value that this data brings to an organization. But I also think like data literacy and just making sure wherever, you know, that that whomever is using data knows how to be critical of it and ask the right questions and look for the right things instead of just uh, blindly trusting it. Anyway, that's, I can, I could talk about that um, unprompted. For a while so I just won't I won't even go there but um outside of like kind of my day job I am really involved in the data community um I lead a variety of Tableau user groups myself I'm from Milwaukee so not too far from Chicago um and then yeah I just kind of do I don't know I feel like my job is also my hobby and so I'm just like a complete data nerd and my my free time is also spent doing data things so um, enough about me. Here's what we're going to cover today. So I have a variety of kind of best practices and tips, um, and they kind of fall into a few different buckets. So the first is kind of like your setup or how we're going to talk a little bit about curating data sources. Um, then we're going to talk about developing um, and building stuff in Tableau Desktop and what that looks like and some things that you can do there um, to help not only with data governance, but just um, like documentation um, and, and leaving, like being transparent about what you're doing and how you're using the data. Then we're gonna move into Tableau Server or Tableau Cloud. I'm gonna just, I'll probably just say Tableau Server from now on, 
but they're pretty synonymous. So um, in Tableau Server, we've got data quality warnings and we've got um, some metadata um, capabilities and tools at our disposal. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. What I will note is you'll see a few of these items have asterisks on them. Um, this requires the Tableau data management add-on, which is an additional cost, but um, unlocks a variety of additional capabilities. So um, I will I will note I will mention um, when we when I go through my demo today, I will make sure to call out which items require this add-on. Um, but I think it's really helpful to kind of see it in, um, I don't know, see it in use, I guess, um, and get a little demo of it. Um, I don't know, it, it'll just hopefully um, be enlightening. Anyway, I find it a very helpful tool. So that's enough with the slide deck. Let's jump into Tableau um, and dive into some kind of best practices. My hope is that these are kind of very simple steps um, and tips that you can start to implement. Um, maybe they inspire you um, to, to kind of just do a little bit extra um, when you're kind of going through your day to day. Um, and as we all know, like data governance or documentation, I mean, let me just say real, one thing real quick about documentation. It, can sometimes be terrible to write. I mean, let's be honest, nobody wants to document and define every little element, but boy, when you have it, it's so nice. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, okay. Dan, Daniel loves documentation, awesome. Yeah, I feel like, again, when it's done well, it can be really nice. So I've got a few hacks, I suppose, um, that I'll share that make it a little bit easier for me. Um, so let's dive in. Okay, so right now you should be seeing a very boring looking um, Tableau desktop <laughs> instance. Um, we're gonna, before we even talk about like building something on Tableau desktop, I'm gonna talk about um, connecting to data. So um, you can see here, I have four data sources already set up. Um, yes, this is my resume that I've built in Tableau, but that part is, is not really important at the moment. Um, what I'm going to first show is if we want to connect to a new data source. So typically, um, you know, if you're building something from scratch in Tableau, the first thing that you'll do is connect to data. Um, now, if your data, I typically like connecting to data that's like a data source that's already been prepared for me or curated that's out on my Tableau server environment. And so we're kind of already talking a little bit about Tableau server right from the um, outset here, but I wanna show this cool feature. So first I need to sign in to my Tableau server environment. Excellent. Does anybody else get nervous typing? Live, maybe just me. Okay, so we're signed in. So um, when I went to connect to the data, um, these are the data sources that I have available to me um, in my Tableau server instance. Um, and so there's four data sources out there and this one has a green check mark. And when I hover over this little icon, I can see that this data source is certified. So that's one of the first things I, I really love about the Tableau platform is your ability to certify a data source. Um, so I can even see that there's a note here that says that this data source completed the certification process on August 9th. It's very small text, which is why I read it to you. Um, but I really like that you can certify data sources. And we'll talk a little bit more, I guess, about what that might look like. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about how to um, how to like get that certification check mark on your data source. Um, I what I will say is um, if you if you go down this path of certifying data sources, so this is where I think um, maybe to Daniel's point earlier, governed data versus non-governed data. I do agree with Tim. There's definitely a spectrum, 
But unfortunately, in the Tableau uh, server space, it is very binary. You have a certified data source or you don't. Um, I would say, you know, what I, my best practice is if I'm going to certify a data source, we actually have a certification process. So we pick a data source, um, maybe it's highly used or, um, you know, it, it contains sensitive information or whatever it is. It goes to, a, you know, a specific audience that happens to be um, high profile. We have a certification process. We make sure that we go through and we look at, you know, where we're sourcing the data from, um, what calculations might or transformations might be happening to that data, um, how we're, you know, refreshing that data on the Tableau server side of things, right? You don't want to have a certified data source that contains stale data that's over a year old. So um, we kind of have the certification process and then we have both our data governance team and our analytics team kind of signing off on that. Um, and then once that process has uh, happened, then we go through and we actually um, mark the data sources certified. Clicking on this data source, I then get a description. And so this is kind of my second tip. So aside from certifying your data source, which for end users makes it really clear, I probably this, if there's two, if there's two data sources out there that look like they might help me, I'm gonna go for the one that has that certification check mark, right? Um, so aside from that, having uh, data source descriptions are also really helpful. Um, so here, this data source is intended to answer questions about my educational background. Um, it's sourced from a manually maintained Google, uh, Google Sheet, and every record represents, you know, an organization or a role that I have. Um, again, this is for my resume, but I think it goes to show um, the types of information that might be helpful. Uh, to an end user who's using this data source. So where's this data coming from? What level of granularity is it at? Um, you could even add like the data steward information in this description. So um, I guess my next tip is to figure out the components of information that you think are gonna be really helpful for, you know, for users of your data source and design like a description template um, where you kind of prompt, you prompt people for, okay, you know, if I'm the owner of this data source or I'm the data steward or creator of this data source, here's the information that I need to articulate to end users about this data. Um, and so I find that a template makes it really easy. So all I have to do is just fill in the blanks of this template and I've got my description. So again, that data steward information is also really great in here. I would say if there are any caveats to the data, uh, maybe what the intended purpose is or potential uses for it, I think all of that is really helpful in your uh, data description. Um, one thing I will say is through creating this presentation, I actually feel like this might be a really great topic for my blog. So I plan on writing a blog post that provides some templates for data source descriptions, project descriptions, um, et cetera. And then also potentially another blog post about like what does a data source certification process look like in Tableau? So if those things are of interest to you, feel free to go out and follow me either on LinkedIn or, or my blog. Um, I don't mean to be to self-promote, I'm just saying that's not something I've written yet, but I plan to. So if that's of interest to you, feel free to go follow. Okay, so I'm not actually gonna connect to this data source because I already have it here, but, um, but I really do like that certification option. Um, one thing I will say is if you, we're going to get to this a little bit later as well in Tableau Server, some data quality warnings. But what's cool is when you set a data quality warning, it actually shows up in Tableau Desktop. So if I'm using this data, I can see that there's a data quality warning on this data set. So this data set is under maintenance. And again, I can add a little note. Um, in this case, it says, please be advised that this data source is re being refactored by the data management team. So it sounds very official. Um, but Anyway, just something cool. Um, okay. 
Uh, one other tip, I guess, when it comes to curating a really great data source is adding field descriptions. And so when I hover over this field or really any field in this data source, I can see a definition. Um, so here it's the city and state or country where an activity took place um, or distinguishes between education experience and extra professional activities. So I'm a big fan of adding field descriptions. So in order to do that, if you are the person curating that data source or, you know, if you're you know, maybe using an Excel file and you want to define what these fields are, um, you right click on that field, you go to default properties and comment. And then you can, this is just a text box so you can write anything in here that you would like. So one thing that I thought was kind of interesting in, in Tim's presentation, he talked about um, race and how to define those different classifications and he mentioned the census. And so I actually um, looked up this census has like a whole page where they define the different um, race uh, categories. And I'm kind of curious if, you know, let's say, let's say this field happened to be about race. Um, I wonder if we were to say, um, Oh, okay. sorry, my keyboard wasn't working for a second, so that's fun. My keyboard's being very annoying today. Apologies. Um, okay. Copy the link. I was just curious if this link would show up. So it doesn't really, it's not something I can click on um, in there. But again, I can leave, you know, any sort of text here. So if an end user needs to come in and learn more about, you know, how these different races are defined, they could do that. So um, big fan of field definitions. Again, this is a really great place. And, and I don't think there's a limit either. So I could have put um, the text from that page directly in here. Um, but I'm just a big fan of, um, I could have done that or something. Um, Brandy, so yeah. Can I ask a question? Please do, yeah. Yeah, so this is Heather. Um, wondering if, I'm seeing the insert button up there and I'm wondering if the definitions could be stored in a database and then visible here. Have you tried that before? Kind of like you can put in a, a tool tip? Um, it's a great question. I haven't tried that before. Let's see if I do like a new. Oh, it, it appears to be grayed out. So I don't really know. I've okay. never seen this not grayed out, but good question. What I will say is I do know that Tableau is like working on integrations with other tools like, um, I think it's like Alation, and I think there's maybe others that are more enterprise-wide data glossaries that would integrate with this capability. So I think that those are things that they're working on. Um, okay. But for right now, yeah, the, the kind of manual field definition seems to be where it's at. Um, great question though. Okay, so let's keep rolling because I I'm already becoming long-winded. Um, so the other thing uh, that I like to do when it comes to kind of documentation is in my calculated field. So this is a calculated field that has an equal sign. If you right click and edit your calculated field, you can leave comments in your calculated field. So you do that by uh, putting like a slash slash right at the beginning. And then anything after that, that's on that same line, um, any text after that, will be a comment. And so I find that I tend to comment my calculated fields as much as possible. And you can actually have multiple comments within it too. So here's like another comment right here. Um, so highly recommend comments and calculated fields. Um, it kind of helps you, I mean, especially if you have a complex calculation, it leaves clues for later, or maybe it like you can, you can explain why you had to do something in a certain way. You know, we all kind of work with dirty data sometimes, and sometimes you have to create a calculated field to kind of 
um, whether it's create a level of detail expression to aggregate data at a different level, um, whatever it is, adding comments uh, to your calculated fields is super helpful. Cool. Um, and then we'll actually talk, this will come up again later. So um, just note that. And then the last tip that I really have within Tableau Desktop, I know we haven't like, we haven't actually built anything in Tableau Desktop. There's not a lot of, in my mind, data governance best practices when it comes to building a visualization besides knowing what data you're working with and how it should be used. But um, one other tip, this isn't even really um, around uh, data governance, but I just like to show it anyways, because I think it's one of those like underutilized areas. But in, in Tableau, desktop when you've built something. Um, typically, um, let's actually, I'll come back to this in a second. We're going to jump over to this sheet. So um, you can have, so this is just a basic bar chart. If I right click on the canvas, the gray spot in the background, um, there's not only the title card, but there's also a caption card. And the caption card is like, automatically generated by Tableau. And it, it, it attempts to define what's taking place on that view. Um, so here it, you know, it, it's just not very good. I've never once seen it actually used or actually be that great. Um, I would love to know if anybody here has used the caption card and if it actually does a good job. But what I've decided, is to repurpose that caption card as a place to leave my self documentation. So, in this case, this is a, a radial, like a, a spider graph. Um, and this was a whole, whole new chart type for me. So, I actually had to look up how to do it. And there are two how to articles that I felt like were really valuable. So, I linked them. Um, and then I even left myself a little note. Um, and so what I find is this caption card is a really great place to leave resources for maybe other people or even yourself later on. Um, if you're like, okay, wait, I know I created this thing, but um, why did I create it? Or why did I create it this way? Or again, maybe it was a complex chart type. Sometimes I also find I leave instructions for other people on my team who might have to support this chart. Like, okay, when we have a new client do, you know, one, two, and three. So just a really great feature that I think um, can be repurposed as notes. Um, so if I double click on this, why is it being, sorry. Sorry, Tableau is being kind of irritating today. Do you edit the auto-generated caption? Yes, I do. Um, for some reason, Tableau is not letting me. Do I have a field? Sometimes that happens when you have like a, whatever, I don't know what happened. Um, oh, I see, ha <laughs> ha. Okay, it was behind Zoom, so that's great. Uh, this is just a text box, very similar to that comment feature um, where you can just type stuff in here. But yes, I just, I will go into like the auto-generated version of the caption and just delete this out and type in what I want. So great question. Anyway, okay. So that's just like a bit of what I do in Tableau Desktop. Um, let's talk a little bit about Tableau Server because I think Tableau Server is really useful in a variety of ways and really helps to scale up data governance. So we're gonna jump over to a Tableau Server environment. Okay, so this is a um, dev instance of Tableau Cloud, um, which again is very similar to Tableau Server. Um, 
So let's first talk about that published data source. So um, okay. So I just kind of went to my resume project um, and there are actually two published data sources here. So this one is that certified data source. Um, we can see that definition for the data source right in Tableau server, which is like another reason why I really like it. Um, and we also see the this published events data source. So, I'm going to open up events in a different tab and I'm going to open up the education and experience data source here. So the first thing I'm actually going to show you is how to certify a data source and it's quite easy. Um, so you're going to click the information icon and in this space is where you can edit the about or the description in this case. You can also down at the bottom is edit certification status. So if we edit that it's literally just a checkbox where you can say this data is certified. So theoretically, you can certify all your data sources, which is why I really recommend that you define some sort of data source certification process or threshold. Um, and then I like to leave a note. On the web. I don't know what Siri thinks I'm asking about, but um, I also like to leave a note around when this data source was certified, just so that people are aware and I like to have a recertification like a recertification process as well like just like a review every year of certified data sources so that's all you have to do to certify a data source that part's pretty easy um, let's jump over to the other tab the events data source. This is the data source that we saw that was under maintenance so I want to talk a little bit about this now this is a feature that comes um, with the Tableau data management add-on. So just to be clear, but when you have the data management add-on, if you click the three dots next to a published data source, this is not an option for data sources that only live within your Tableau workbook. This, this option is only available for data sources that have been published separately to your Tableau server, or Tableau cloud instance, but you have the option to add a data quality warning. And there are two types of quality warnings. The first is um, a manually set quality warning. So this is just a toggle to turn it on or off. And then there are different types of warnings, um, whether it's just like a warning or maybe this data source is deprecated and so eventually it's going away. Um, you may want to, you know, alert all users of that, or maybe the data is stale, whatever it is, or there's even a sensitive data one, you can even, you know, turn this on for all data that maybe contains sensitive information. Um, and then you can add a note. So a note is required. Um, there are also two levels of visibility. So standard visibility just means that it's a note when somebody's using the data source. So whether you're on Tableau desktop um, or later we'll see it in the data details tab. Um, but high visibility means that a warning will actually appear whenever an end user navigates to that dashboard. So all your end users would be aware that this data source is you know, stale or under maintenance or might not be updated, whatever it is. Um, it even gets sent with subscriptions. Okay, so that's data quality warning number one. The other is an extract refresh monitoring warning. It's a mouthful. Basically, this is an automated warning that will be added if the refresh of this data source fails. So I really like this one, especially if you have like data sources that are being refreshed on a regular basis. Um, you know, if it fails, I don't know if you're anything like me, I've gotten end users coming to me being like, hey, my dashboard's not updated. You know, I'm not seeing today's data. Well, wouldn't it be nice if a warning just automatically appeared for end users to say, by the way, you know, this data refresh failed, your data, your dashboard may, may be out of date. So those are the two uh, data quality warning options. Um, again, highly, highly recommend both of them. 
They're really cool. Okay, moving on. Um, let's talk a little bit about that data details tab. So I'm gonna go back and I'm actually gonna navigate into my resume, which we were kind of looking at before in Tableau Desktop, but you didn't really see the whole thing. So um, this was just a fun project for me. And while I was building it, I defined every field, which is why it's my demo. Um, plus it's not sensitive information, so I can share it. Um, so when you, when any end user is in, you know, looking at a dashboard, Again, if you have the Tableau data management add-on, there will be a data details button somewhere along the top. Right now it's on the left, sometimes it's on the right. Um, but if you click that, it actually will open up a pane on the right-hand side, which shows you a variety of information about this dashboard. The first is actually views of that dashboard. So if, I, if you're the owner of a dashboard, it might be kind of cool to come in and look at like how frequently is, my, is this dashboard being used. But for your end users, they can also see who owns it. So if they have questions about it, they know who to go to. Next up, we have the data sources. So this will show you all the data sources used in this dashboard. It'll even show you when it was last updated. So you know whether you're looking at updated information. Okay. And then finally, we have the fields that are used in this dashboard. And so if I'm like looking at, you know, something, um, for example, this is my activity, my whatever experience and stuff. If I'm interested in what that is, I can actually expand this field and I get that definition. Oh, I see, okay. Or activity name, I can see what all of that is. Um, and then for calculated fields, just like we did, just like we saw um, in Tableau Desktop, that uh, comment, you see that here as well. So when you take the time to define your fields and um, add comments to your calculated fields, if you have that Tableau data management add-on and you have this data details pane, you're making all of that information directly available to end users, which in my experience, like minimizes the amount of questions that you get about it because they can kind of go out and explore and answer the, their own questions about it. And now again, transparency, like everyone is aware of what this field is. They're aware of what this data source is and where it comes from and when it was last updated and you don't have to answer those questions. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of that data details tab. Let's talk a little bit more about view usage though. So this again, I mean, I think Timothy mentioned this, but um, you know, knowing how often something is used is actually really helpful. Um, and there's a few different ways that we can do that. But if you're the end, if you're the owner of a dashboard, you can actually come out and um, click on the three dots. So I'm on, I'm right now I've navigated to this workbook and this workbook has one view. And um, if I click these three dots, I can actually see who has seen this view. And it's going to be the most boring thing because I'm the only one that has access. But you can see, you know, who's viewed it, um, when the last time they viewed it was, and how many times they viewed it. So I kind of really like that. There's also, um, if we switch to, let's actually look at a more interesting example. Um, I'm going to go into this dashboard. Um, so this is the grid view, uh, which is good. But if you put it into list view, you can also just look at how many views there have been over all time. Um, you can even change that to say, what about in the last three months? Like, how has that changed? So just as an FYI, that, that view usage is there. To, to people who, I don't even think you have to own um, the dashboard or the workbook in order to see this, but you do need to own it if you wanna see this. So, 
Uh -huh, this one has two people. All right, excellent. Um, so for me, I feel like I tend to look at, you know, who has you, you know, are, are there any data sources that haven't been used or don't have any connections to them? If they don't have any connections, I, I usually tend to delete them or at least follow up with people to delete them. I find a very tidy server environment is better for everybody. Um, so that's one takeaway, I guess, that I utilize with, uh, with that view usage. Um, the last thing I wanna point out, and again, this is another thing. So the view usage is available to anybody with Tableau Server. Um, this next feature is another one of those components that's only available if you have the data management add-on. But I'm gonna jump back into this resume um, except what I'm going to point out here is this lineage tab. So on the lineage tab, um, this is all available out of the box. Once you set up the data management add-on, um, all of this is available right out of the box. So first of all, we see that there are four embedded data sources within this workbook, and I could do a drop down and select one if I'd like. I can also see um, all of the fields in that data source the definition of those fields, how many sheets that field is used on. You can see all of that right here. Um, this lineage section on the right shows you kind of where we're at right now, which is at the workbook. And the workbook utilizes four different tables from one database or, or one file, in this case, one Google Sheet. Um, but then going down, um, this workbook has seven sheets within it, one dashboard, and three metrics are created off of it. And in this case, there's only one owner. But you can imagine potentially a data source um, being used in multiple workbooks on multiple sheets, having multiple owners. Let's say something's wrong with this you know, activity category field, and I want to alert the people who would be impacted by it. If I select that, this view kind of updates to show me, okay, this field is only used in one sheet. And I can click on that sheet to see which one it is. I can even see you know, which owner owns that, like owns those items. Um, so again, if there's something wrong with a field, um, I can select that field and see which owners would be impacted. And then I can select all of those owners and send them an email right from Tableau. So that's another, I guess, just, to me, this is really the power of the, the data management add-on. Not that I'm trying to sell it. I'm just saying it's like super cool. Um, but I really love the data lineage tool. You can really see, again, where fields are coming from, where they're used, and who's using them. So I, be, I you know, between data lineage and data quality warnings and field definitions and certified data sources, there are so many cool things that you could take advantage of in the Tableau platform to help people who are creating stuff off of Tableau Desktop, but also people who are just consuming stuff within Tableau Server. Um, so that, that those are kind of my basic tips um, with data governance in Tableau. Um, I know I'm a little bit over. Um, what I will say real quick is, and I want to take some questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. But what I will say is I'm going to send my presentation um, to your leadership team. They can kind of disseminate it. But um, a lot of what I've talked about is outlined in some of my blog posts. So this first blog post and the second blog post talks a little bit about some of the things I've already covered. These other two I wanted to share because they're, they're slightly older blog posts. But one of the things I did not talk about today was security, was permissioning. Um, you know, there's, there's actually even more, um, kind of view usage, like usage information that you can get from the repository that lives behind, um, Tableau server. Um, and I talk a little bit about how you can do that. Um, and then kind of security best practices, guidelines, things like that. So I, I just figured this would be a group that might value those resources. So I'll share all of that. Um, but. I'll pause there. I know I kind of was talking pretty fast and I covered a lot. Are there any questions? If 
No, I put everyone to sleep. Excellent. Um, cool. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it was, it was just wonderful to come and speak to you. I, I feel like I'm very, very excited about Tableau, uh, the entire platform and just the different ways that we can leverage it. Um, again, I would just say building things in Tableau is amazing. It's all of those little extras that I think help make it help end users just better utilize data, right? And the more that we can put that information at their fingertips, um, you know, where they can use, use, utilize data in the right way um, without having to go to, you know, a data glossary to find, you know, all of that information about how to use a data source. Um, I find that that's really, the, the more that we can do that, the better. But thank you so much for letting me come and speak to you today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brandy. And you absolutely did not put anyone to sleep. I, <laughs> that was a great presentation. Um, I know it, I definitely learned a few tips and tricks that I am going to show my team tomorrow at the morning huddle. So I'm excited for that. Awesome. Um, and feel free if anyone has um, questions that come up later, feel free to add them in and we'll get them to Brandy, see if she can um, answer them. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll pop in and share my screen. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about some new things in Tableau. Um, I think Imran and possibly Chandani have some things they want to share. Sure, um, Kitty, I can share my screen. Sure. So it could be easier. Can you guys see my screen? Tableau one? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is the 2022.1 uh, new features. Um, I use some of them. Uh, personally, I like uh, uh, the new search experience. Uh, uh, they, they change the layout of how we search and, and come up with the more innovative ideas, uh, how they can show us more relevant and more useful uh, dashboard in, in our organization. Um, first time when I it, they introduced in 2020.1, I was a little bit un, unsure about this new kind of view because I used to uh, used to with the old outlook. But now I, I have a kind of hang of it and uh, I can see my most used uh, dashboards and, and most popular dashboard. Also, they, they introduce workbook optimizer. So when we are published and, and we are planning to publish, they, they, they send us some alerts and give some best practices uh, checks. And if we are uh, something they, they found inappropriate or is, if the query is taking longer than usual, uh, they highlight that and, and we can go and fix it. Another, um, uh, we have started using us data in our organization and in the in this new version they come up with the more user friendly us data now you can use the phrase and 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 the filter some of the stuff uh, uh, easier than before i found it's more user friendly than what is uh what, what was there in the first version. So they, they improve a lot uh, in the new version. And I also share the link in, in our chat box, the new features, uh, they are coming up with 2022.2. Um, I, I think Brandy mentioned some of the plugins they are coming, uh, she, she touched on that. Um, so, so I'm, I, I, I haven't uh, experienced this one or check this one, but this is something you can, you can plug in some more, more, uh, 
more applications within Tableau, like uh, we have in other Tableau, uh, other cloud technologies. So this is something I'm, I'm looking forward to learn more about it. And uh, yeah, this all I, I found it more more interesting and recently published uh, in the new features. Uh, please, uh, happy to share your favorite feature in the chat box, or you can speak. I uh, will stop sharing and hand it over to Chani. Chani have some questions, uh, fun question to to ask the audience. Yeah. Um, so. I'll jump back to the new features. Um, one feature I am most excited about is the copy and paste feature. I can't believe we didn't have that before for some reason. Um, we do a lot of standardization across all of our dashboards. So with 200 plus dashboards, if I'm renewing any of the features or if I'm changing up any colors or whatever it is, um, I'm so excited to be able to just copy and paste from workbook to workbook or dashboard to dashboard or whatever it is. Um, but that's the one feature I'm most excited about. Um, yeah, let us know if you're excited about any of the other features as you transition to either a new version of uh, Tableau Server, Tableau Desktop, um, whatever it may be. The question I wanted to ask everyone is as you guys become more ingrained in Tableau or either you're starting out or you're well into Tableau, um, I just wanted to see who is certified to, um, and what type of certification everyone has with Tableau. Um, so previously, or I guess currently, I have the old certification of the desktop specialist, but I know since they've gotten rid of that, um, a lot of people may have transitioned to um, the data analyst certification or whatever other certifications there may be for Tableau. So yeah, I just wanted to see what everyone thinks of the new certification, if you've taken a, the test or anything like that. Brandy, you have your hand up. I do, I was just answering your question. I. Yeah a few different certifications. I recently took the Tableau desktop specialist exam. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and it was, it was, I mean, you know, it's really geared towards people who have like three months in, or so of Tableau experience and it was pretty easy. I think it was like yeah. less, it's like less than an hour it takes, so. Awesome. Yeah. Um, do, does anyone have any other certifications in Tableau? So I've taken only the desktop one, like Brandy said, but I don't know how the other certifications work and how useful, I guess, each of those um, certifications are or what kind of um, information, if there is any extra information you find from those certifications or tests. Feel free to unmute yourself, by the way. <laughs> or send in a chat. While people are doing that, I was just gonna say like, you know, having multiple certifications, like for me, I, it doesn't lead to like a promotion or anything necessarily, but mm. I do think it shows both motivation and I think like, okay, I don't know if you're anything like me, but in my experience in Tableau, I feel like I keep going back to the same chart types are the same ways yeah. of something and it yeah. kind of forced me to learn something new you know like I kind of had to study up on something like maps uh -huh. which I don't use that often and so yeah I feel like that was kind of nice it more so helped fill in some gaps for me yeah yeah definitely yeah we we do the since we do the standardization of all the dashboards it becomes very repetitive um so definitely would look into more of the certifications for that reason I guess yeah well, that desktop specialist one was like a hundred dollars, which that's not bad. It's not bad. I mean, you know, I totally understand, you know, whatever. It, I, I'm grateful for the fact that a hundred dollars doesn't, isn't that expensive. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, part of me is like, I don't know, did, did your employer help cover the cost of your certification? Yeah, they did. Um, and then it's been over two years now, so I probably should take it again and <laughs> get the, I think the 
the not the desktop specialist one, but the data analyst one. That one's in the beta version when I last saw it. Um, so I wonder if they, if Tableau has already created a permanent version of that data analyst certificate. But yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I feel like they keep coming out with new certifications. It's a little hard to keep track of. Yes, <laughs> and I don't know how useful they are. So I tend to not look at them as long as I know I'm playing around with the dashboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a server certification a couple of years ago. I'm not sure it's still active. Yeah. But yeah, they come up with a new certification. And But the good thing about Tableau is even you don't have certification, a lot of information available on YouTube and they have a great uh, Tableau community. Yeah. So it's really helpful. And if someone is new, uh, they can learn uh, from the basic very easily. Yeah. So yeah, we have a... We have someone that's a new coworker of mine and she's going through um, learning Tableau just from the, the videos that are available through Tableau. Um, we're not doing any course or anything like that because it's almost the same information if you were to do a course or if you were to just learn through the Tableau videos at your own pace, I guess. Cool. Um, yeah, that's kind of the only question I had. I just wanted to see how um, everyone was doing with the Tableau certification or with the new features. Yeah, I'm guessing a lot of the silence is from people not having certifications. I know I yeah. don't have one, but <laughs> yeah, um, Brandy, you brought up a good point that it's um, like, uh, it gives more than just the certification. You learn about some new things along the way, which is good. And I think maybe I'll check that out. Oh. All right. Does anyone have any other questions or about the content, anything about Tableau? Any questions you want to ask? Maybe you've encountered an issue well creating a dashboard or anything like that, um, that you might wanna ask the group and see if there's any feedback, anyone who might have experienced the same issues as you, um, feel free to ask away. Otherwise we are done for the day. Yeah, and I'd like to say thank you again to our wonderful presenters. I know I definitely learned a thing or two or more about data governance and you guys really made it seem not as daunting as sometimes <laughs> it can seem originally um, but just a big shout out and thank you and just a reminder to everyone else on the call we are always looking for um, our next presenters for the next tableau user group if you're um, have something you want to share or something cool you learned about in Tableau, or if you just have ideas for topics, feel free to um, email any one of us of the leadership group or put it on our Chicago Healthcare Tableau user group page through the um, Tableau community website. Uh, and thank you again. I have a good rest of your Thursday. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.